called out, we need to pray. And I was startled. No one has ever done that to me before, before I got to preach, and it wasn't because I had such a big sermon manuscript. <laughs> I said, what, what do we need to pray about? And that's how I learned that the day before, Mike Brown Jr., an 18-year-old boy, tall, large, was killed by a police officer. Witnesses said he had had his hands up, but his motionless body lay on the pavement for four and a half hours, which is a very long time. And his mother and his father and his friends and his neighbors gathered and bore witness and became outraged. Imagine having your loved one's body violently destroyed lying in public for that long. I didn't know any of the backstory. I, that was the first I had heard about it and any of the other interpretations that would quickly swirl through the community. That Sunday, none of us knew how the events of those few hours would change the community of Ferguson, the state, the nation, and the world. A friend of mine was in Paris at the airport during this time, and uh, they said, where are you from? And she said, I'm from St. Louis. And they said, is that near Ferguson? For those of us who are from this area, we know St. Louis is big, and Ferguson is a small little municipality just about 20, 25 minutes from here. At the 30,000-foot level, the Ferguson Uprising was directly connected to the Civil War. Remember, Missouri was a slave state. Missouri was a slave state. St. Louis, as you know, was on the border of Illinois, which was a free state. And because we had, at the time of the Civil War, many German immigrants who were staunchly heartily pro-union, as in United States of America Union, the slave state of Missouri did not trust our fair city to behave properly if secession, when secession, came along. So the state government established the bounds of St. Louis City and took over its police department. You might notice this little thing. You see the white circle? That's basically the firewall of St. Louis City. You might want to look this up. Just You can look for St. Louis municipalities, and you'll see this picture. But the state government established the bounds of our city and took over its police department, and they kept control of it until, wait for it, 2013, the year before Mike Brown was killed. Amazingly long time that the governor of the state was in control of who was accountable at the police department. On the outside of that firewall of the city proper is the city, the county of St. Louis. And after the city bounds were fixed, hundreds of municipalities, 100, less than 188, municipalities popped up. So all that little quilt work that you see up there are municipalities. There was Webster Groves, there was Kirkwood, there's Clayton, there's Jennings, there's Ferguson. 83, 83 municipalities. And all those squares tell you where those municipalities are. Each one has its own mayor, municipal government, police department, and those municipalities have to raise money to pay for their little fiefdoms. The way they were established is so they could control who moved there. Who went to their schools? Who didn't? Now, one way to quietly prevent the poor and the people of color from moving in was this system and many others, but this one, housing systems that we got, I'd have a hundred page sermon on. So this was a profound injustice to some people and a profound privileging for others Police discrimination and police taxation helped pay for municipalities. Fundamentally, that is why the death of that young man became the Ferguson Uprising. The unjustness of his death is one thing, but the system that was the powder keg around it is what I want us all to walk out of here remembering. 
The Federal Department of Justice did a report on Ferguson. They found that this Ferguson report released in March of 2015 said this, and I quote, the city's emphasis on revenue generation had a profound effect on the Ferguson Police Department's approach to law enforcement. You with me? So they had to pay the bills, and they didn't want to make all the people who live there, which is not all that many, pay such high bills. The way to do it? Citation, citation, citation. You don't pay it, you don't show up, because you don't just get to pay it. You got to show up at court. And if you don't show up at court, you get a bench warrant. If you don't, if, when you get caught, you get put in jail. And you have to pay a lot of money to get out of jail. It was a system re extracting money, particularly from the poor and people who were black. The police were being turned into revenue collectors, and citizens could not trust them, especially black and brown citizens. They were, their trust, their confidence in the police was completely undermined. Here's something the report continues with. In 2013 alone, the year before this young man was killed by a police officer, the court issued 9,000 warrants on cases stemming in large part from minor violations such as parking infractions, traffic tickets, and housing code violations. Jail time would be considered, uh, this is the federal government talking here, okay? Department of Justice says, Jail time would be considered far too harsh a penalty for the great majority of these code violations. Yet Ferguson's municipal court routinely issues warrants for people to be arrested and incarcerated for failing to timely pay related fees and fines. In other words, people receive citations for not mowing their lawn. If they didn't show up in court, they were arrested and jailed. It was outrageous. It was everywhere. The injustice was well known and felt by people of color. Folks knew where you could drive and where you couldn't, and they still do. Those of us who are white didn't know or didn't care. I knew I didn't care. I lived over in my sweet municipality of Webster Groves. I knew stuff was going over there. I was busy. I wasn't thinking about it. It didn't touch me. This is the 30,000 foot view of what happened in the Ferguson uprising. Police officers turned into tax collectors, people forced into debtor's prison for failure to pay. A boy walked in the street, the boy died. The body lay in the street and the people would not let it go. The next day on Sunday, I prayed with my congregation. I'm sure it was feeble and ignorant. I knew so little, so, so little. I couldn't have told you anything I just told you about. Ferguson taught me that. Ferguson taught me about dry bones, the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel's prophecy. I always thought of it as the remnant of a healthy, vibrant army that had fought and died. But maybe that valley of dry bones was an army of the oppressed, a people who had never had a chance to fulfill their purpose, never felt the bounty of this land, or felt safe, or felt a sense of belonging in this nation at all. Because life had conspired, because history had conscripted, because those with power consistently undermined their hope of ever being seen as fully human. One of the greatest preachers of the 20th century, Dr. Samuel DeWitt Proctor, said this. We do not all start at the same scratch line. You know a scratch line, like when you're a kid and you write, put that line in the sand and you all stand beside it and you're all going to do the race? Truth is, we don't all start at the same scratch line. He said, you were born owning nothing, having earned nothing just born. You are indebted to everybody. But some of us opened our eyes and saw nothing but blessing just dumping down on us. 
He said, I opened my eyes and there was Herbert and Velma and my grandma Hattie, a slave in Chesterfield County who graduated college in 1882. They were smiling on me. How in the world could I lose? Taught me how to read, sing four-part harmony before I ever got to school, taught me how to play clarinet and the piano, made me go to Sunday school. Daddy didn't send us, Daddy took us to Sunday school. If there was nobody in Sunday school but one person, that had been me and my daddy and my four little sisters and brothers in Sunday school at Bank Street Baptist Church. That's what I inherited. I didn't earn it. You can't get that with a visa card. It was given to me, he says. And then he continues. All through my neighborhood, there were other young fellows. I could remember all of them. Daddies were drunk half the time. They didn't read in their homes. Nobody went to Sunday school. None of that. They started life below the scratch line. I started my life halfway above the scratch line. Everywhere I went, someone said, aren't you Miss Hattie's grandson, skip three gates? I never was in third grade, fifth grade, or seventh grade. Everything smiling on me. None of that did I deserve. I hadn't earned any of it. I started out with a full head of steam, and my buddies up the street had none of that. Are you with me? We're together? Here is the crux of what he says. If we want those dry bones to live again, those of us who have inherited the benefits that we did not earn or deserve need to turn around and help those who inherited deficits they did not earn or deserve and help them rise above the scratch line so that they can enjoy the benefits that we so often take for granted. Can these bones live again, O oh Lord? These bones can live. Dr. Proctor, Dr. King, Asada, so many teachers living and dead gathered to speak truth and wisdom into the protests of Ferguson. So many arms locked at the elbow, chanting and marching, all crying out so that change could, cut, could come so that people couldn't be put in jail because they crossed the street and didn't use the crosswalk and ended up with $300 owed to Ferguson. Can you imagine? In the 88 municipalities of St. Louis County where 88 mayors, city council, city hall, city planners, city police departments have to be paid, the system by design keeps the region from thriving. Dry bones everywhere. Look at the public schools in our city, in our region. Look at the income disparities between Clayton and Jennings, a 10 minute drive from each other and the lifespan between these two places is 40 years difference, 30 years. It's ridiculous, you can look it up. The dry bones of our infrastructure should be crying out. We should be crying out against them. The barrenness of the north side because of lack of investment. The fact that our public schools have so little property tax going into them because of that little, that awful firewall between city and county where the taxes go into your little municipality instead of into the bucket where we all can thrive. This is an injustice. My participation in the Ferguson Uprising changed me. For over a year, I spent two to three days or nights of my week participating in protests, standing with incredibly brave young people as they prayed, as they marched, as they cried out for justice. I learned to shut up and listen instead of assuming I understood. I learned that love is always stronger than hate, but it requires so much more courage. Jesus was walking to the temple after entering Jerusalem, and on the way he saw a fig tree. The tree was in leaf. It was flourishing, but it had no fruit. Jesus cursed the tree. Then he moved on to the temple, to the church, to his people who love God, the God that he loved, the people who worshiped as he worshiped. And he saw the temple 
and it was flourishing, but it had no fruit. He cursed it. He tore down the systems and said they are wrong. They are wrong. We need to build justice, to act for justice, to let our prayers be embodied just as our sacraments are embodied. When injustice is revealed, when people are turned into tools for cultivating our hatred, blacks, aliens, women without children, MAGA, whatever category we use to define those we are allowed to hate, we are losing the fruit of our faith. Hatred is easy. Love takes courage. One night in January, I went up to the Ferguson Police Department as usual. It's 2015. It was really cold, and it was a community. There were 30 to 100 people there every night. Usually, two of us clergy showed up. On this night, the riot police came out, and they stood in front of the station earlier than usual. This is kind of what it would look like sometimes. The riot police and the people surging forward, already blocking the street in front of the police department. A woman who had suffered injustice was there. She was a big woman, and she was mad. Perhaps she had lost her job, lost her house, her car, because of citations. She had received a bench warrant. Perhaps she had been arrested and sat in jail. Maybe her children had been taken away because she couldn't be there and she didn't have somebody to provide childcare. I don't know. All I saw was the outpouring of anger at what she had suffered, at hatred for the police because they were the symbol of what had happened to her. She joined that crowd and she was in the face of an officer and she was yelling. And my fellow pastor watched her and said, that woman is going to get arrested. Just watch. My heart went out to her, but I also didn't want to interrupt because I didn't want her to turn and look at me with all that jet stream of whew, anger. But I grabbed a cup of hot chocolate and I walked over and I stood beside her for a minute and then right up there, looking at those miserable, impassive officers who are also right up there, shoulder to shoulder with her, she finally took a breath and I said, hey, would you like a cup of hot chocolate? And she stopped and she stopped yelling and she glanced at me and she looked down at the steaming cup of hot chocolate and she took it and she calmed. In my memory, I said to her, why don't you come back here away from the line and take a rest? But the truth is, I probably just got out of there as quick as possible because I didn't know what her next breath would bring. But that wasn't it. It was the little teaspoon of courage I had that love could win over hate and bring her back just for a minute because she didn't get arrested, and that was the goal. I remember that moment out of so many because it was so simple. It was just a little gesture of love, but it took courage from me. And like I said, she was mad. So the sermon is getting long, and it's way longer than my usuals, and I am grateful for your patience. I know you came here to connect with Jesus and not just talk about Ferguson. So here's what I want you to take away from this. Jesus is looking for fruit, not flourishing. You may be doing Pilates or yoga or spiritual this and that and spiritual self-care, and that is good and important. It has its place. But what matters is what's coming out of our lives and helping and healing the community. It's social care, not just self-care. It's building beloved community. Are you doing both, social and self? Jesus wants the flourishing and the fruit. We are called to bear the fruit of the Spirit. You know it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. They are all relational. Those fruits aren't just for me and you and those people close to us. They are for a city that is suffering, for all of our city, all of the places we go. 
We all want to draw a line around the boundary of who receives our fruit. But Jesus is ardently, actively turning the tables on our categories. Whether you choose to fly the white, blue, black flag for the police, or the Black Lives Matter flag, or the MAGA flag, or the rainbow flag, your call and my call is always everywhere to walk in love. And sometimes love means standing outside of our comfort zone and having the humility to learn. Jesus cursed the fig tree turned the tables in the temple, he had no tolerance for passively accepting the unacceptable. He said, my house is to be a house of prayer for all people. And sometimes prayer happens by locking arms with strangers and chanting for justice and calling for change. Will you do it? Think of your excuse because it just came up in your mind. Would you do it? He said, my house is a house of prayer. I hope, I hope that you learn something from this sermon. I hope you are hungry to learn more. We are citizens of this great country and of a greater country still, heaven. Heaven wants to invade our world and heal the brokenhearted and shout freedom for the captive and the favorable year of our Lord. May we be ready to right wrongs, and act so that everyone flourishes, even if they were born in the valley of dry bones, way down below the scratch line. As disciples of Jesus, we can do no less.